Thank you for joining us tonight. We have quite a lot of uh, great photos and I think stories that folks have sent in and we'll be walking through that. And um, this is a, a little less formal program than we've done in the past. I will just say welcome to the party and I'm gonna turn this over to our president, John Eldridge, who is our host for this evening. Well, good evening all, and I'd like to extend my welcome. Happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, blessed Kwanzaa, and Merry Christmas. First of all, for any of you who may have studied chemistry in high school and spent endless hours in the lab session, recall as much as you can, because we are going to put that information to good use tonight when Fran teaches us how to make her special Manhattan cocktail. So if you haven't yet assembled all the ingredients or suitable substitutes, Please do so. We have a nice variety of seasonal items planned for you tonight, but first I would like to introduce my assistant guest host, the most famous engine in the world. And for those of you who have a special favorite, that's great too. But this one is the most famous for you don't, if you don't recognize him, this is Thomas, the tank engine. And he's gonna assist me throughout tonight. Thomas, you can see, on a picture here up at the B&O Train Museum. And he comes out in a Christmas display along with other trains, all of his friends. My Christmas experience with trains started when I turned three years old. I came down and Santa Claus had left a, a train around the Christmas tree, but he had given my dad instructions that it was my dad's to set up and show me how to use. I think by the time I was seven, I got to operate it on my own. <laughs> that train lasted about 10 years. It was built by the Marks Company, and it was rugged. And then she gave it away to some of my friends. When I turned 11, my dad took me over to someone's house who was selling an 4x8 HO layout. It had two concentric circles. It had about a dozen switches, three inches, engines, and I was set for a long time. When my parents moved from Florida, Virginia, in 1971, I was finishing college and they said, John, we're moving. You have to pack up your train. So I used one of those large Amway laundry boxes and I packed up that HO set and it stayed in that box through 10 moves through the Navy for 49 years. And finally, last year, I gave it away to a member of our church. Thomas, I know, I know, there's the one of Thomas at the National Christmas Tree. He's very patriotic and very proud to be there with other trains that are set up each year around the Christmas tree. They're just south of the White House. When I moved to Alexandria, Virginia in 2006, I was at the local antique mall, and there I found it, a Marx train exactly like the one I had had 50 years ago. I bought that train, took it home, hooked it up, it looked, ran, sounded, and smelled just like the original train. That one was given away last year to another church member, so if you want to get in line for any of my priceless treasures, I'll give you the church address and you can sign up. I didn't know much about Thomas until my son turned about two years old, and I took him down to Union Station. He knew all about Thomas, and this is what we saw that day. If you're familiar with how Union Station is set up, the escalator from the Metro comes up right behind where Thomas was. It was lunchtime and I was hungry. I came up and I thought, oh my word, there's Thomas. If Skyler sees Thomas, I'm not gonna have lunch for two hours. So those columns that you see to the right, I pointed up there and got him distracted. Skyler, look at those birds building nests up there and I hustled them right by Thomas. We went in and ate, but then we came back. And there's Skyler with Thomas, one of his good friends, and uh, Skyler's the one on the right. All right, the next picture really? I have is not of Dover Harbor's buffet kitchen. This is the kitchen on the diesel submarine USS Cod. It is uh, uh, open for tours up in Cleveland, Ohio. But I just wanted to show the comparison between the size of what we deal with on Dover Harbor compared to the size of what they dealt with in one of those World War II submarines. You notice it's very compact, a lot of stainless steel. Apologize for the glare from the lights, but the advantage the cook had on the submarine is the sailors had no other place to eat and he fixed 85 of the same meals. And then he would serve meals four times a day. Thomas says he's thirsty. So am I, so what a better time to pass off 
the presentation to Fran. Fran has worked as a Dover Harbor chef for many years. She's quite adept and very accomplished in her creative cuisine and her stylish culinary presentations. She's going to show us how to make a Manhattan. And no, Thomas, you can't have a Manhattan. I'll get you some root beer. Over to Chef Fran, please. Hello, chapter members and faraway friends. I'm Fran Phillips, your Dover chef, and your host for the how-to section of tonight's holiday party. We are going to make a Manhattan. <clears throat> First place we looked for instructions is the commissary book. But what this actually tells us is service. It defines service so that no matter where you are in the Pullman system, from train to train and crew to crew, your experience is the same. It is superlative, but there are no recipes here. What it does tell us is that at a certain point, what Pullman was using was pre-mixed cocktails, stuff bottled to their specifications, one and a half ounces, and um, all you had to do was serve it properly, add the cherry, and that was it. If you were going to actually mix a Manhattan, if you had to, and you you would have uh, eventually on any car with um, liquor service, with drink service, you, they would have carried this book, Drinks by Jacques Straub. And the recipe is here on page 31. A little sidebar here. Prohibition ended in December of 1933, and Pullman was issuing these books by <clears throat> January of 34. No grass growing under those boys. So, the gear that we're going to need. Pullman specifies their number 13 glass to mix it in, which is the same as a 20 ounce beer glass. So that's what we'll use. You need a measuring cup, or a measurer rather, jigger, anything with measuring marks. You need a bar spoon. We don't have a bar spoon, but we're using a Pullman iced teaspoon. Classy. And you will need um, something to put your drink in. So, Pullman specifies a four ounce number four cocktail glass. This is the same size, but um, this is depression glass, not Pullman. But curiously, this is the Manhattan pattern. Fun. If you are somebody who likes a lot of ice, get yourself a rocks glass. You take your ice-filled mixing glass and you want two units of your rye or bourbon. In it goes. You want one unit of red vermouth. And you want two shakes of Angostura bitters. And the Angostura is your industry standard. So there we go. And we give that a, give that a nice stir. And that should do it. If you're smart, you went and got your bar strainer, which I didn't mention, but you can pour that into your cocktail glass or your number four glass, as Pullman would tell you to use. In goes the cherry, and you're done. That's the Manhattan. So looking for something a little different from your average Manhattan, why not try an Applejack Manhattan, which was the favorite of a famous New Yorker might, you might have heard of, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was no stranger to Pullman service. Uh, just substitute Applejack for the rye or bourbon, <clears throat> pardon me, and I'd suggest you go with orange bitters for that one. It makes it really nice and fresh tasting. So, <clears throat> I see my friend Carl over there has his Manhattan at the ready, and um, 
We're going to let him make the toast. Carl? Happy New Year. May 2021 bring us all back together on Dover Harbor. Thank you very much, Fran and Carl. We very much appreciate that. You all can't see what's going on here, but Thomas is furiously mixing root beer with apple juice, trying to make his own specialty of a Manhattan. Fran, thank you for sharing one of your many special concoctions with us. Now we'll show some of the ways that Dover Harbor has been used for New Year's trips. And we'll ask Kevin Tankersley, followed by Bob Bitzer, to give us a rundown. Kevin? Thanks, John. The New Year's, New Year's was the event that probably spawned the longest running overnight Dover Harbor trip. Um, it started out in 1988, uh, named as the New Year's Rail Cruise to New York, and it later the title was shortened to New Year's in New York. And uh, that it was a two-day, one-night trip. Uh, left uh, Washington in the morning of December 31st, and we returned back to New York um, on the evening of January the 1st. And the package included rail travel in Dover Harbor. Uh, to and from, and a night stay at a hotel in New York. Uh, in the beginning, we stayed at that famous railroad hotel, the Hotel Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and then later moved on to some other um, hotels. The fare in 1988 was $205 a person, uh, so it was a really inexpensive way to get in a holiday trip in, in a first-class setting. And then by, by the end of the run in 1999 and 2000, uh, the trip uh, was renamed the 21st Century Express, and it was expanded to three days and two nights. And at that point, the fare was $729 a person. So you can see here in the middle, um, that's the car full of people uh, on their way to New York. Uh, there were a lot of things that people did. Um, there, there was always plenty to do new in New York. Um, and so it being holiday times, there's a lot of sightseeing for holidays, things like going to see the Rockefeller Christmas tree. Uh, dining was also a very big thing. Uh, I remember dinners, especially at Mama Leone's and Frankie and Johnny's Steakhouse, among others. And then, of course, uh, moving on to our next slide, one of the big things was going to see a Broadway show. Uh, every year, there was a group of eight to 12 of the regulars who would attend a show, and, and we saw many good ones, some of which are, are shown here. Uh, and of course, one of the things, for those of you who are theater buffs, can you guess which uh, show closed just four days rather abruptly after we saw it? It's up here. I'll, I'll give you a hint. Betty Buckley was the star of the show. Anyway, the shows, the shows were carefully chosen, uh, not just for the, the sake of the show, uh, but also for the location of the theater, uh, because that was the trick for getting to see the ball drop in Times Square uh, without having to stand there from god awful hours early in the morning. Uh, so, if, for instance, the cats at the Winter Garden Theater after that show ended at about 10.45, uh, it's just a matter of stepping right out the front door of the theater onto Broadway, and we had a straight shot view right at the ball, uh, dropping in a little more than an hour after that. Uh, so that, that was always great to, to see and do. Um, and of course, not everybody went uh, and saw that every year, uh, because in the next slide, uh, we had the centerpiece of the trip, which was the New Year's party on, on the car parked in Penn Station. Uh, the car was usually parked on track two uh, in Penn Station, which is those of you who know Penn Station are the New Jersey transit tracks. Uh, the party would start at, at 9 p.m. for those uh, that, that didn't want to venture out or had, had earlier in the evening plans. Uh, and then people would join in as they got away from their show or after they saw the ball drop in Times Square. And the party would go on until the last person left uh, back to the hotel. Uh, and I remember one year that was 5.30 in the morning. So uh, it, it was quite a rowdy, rowdy crowd. 
Um, so you can see here some of the folks enjoying the, the party. Um, you may recognize that fella uh, in the middle picture, um, yours truly, uh, along with um, our dear friend of Dover Harbor, Nancy Swan, uh, one year. Uh, the champagne, of course, flowed, uh, and it normally was Cook's uh, Brut, which uh, was the champagne that Pullman used uh, in, in their system. Uh, and so here's some souvenirs. Um, actually, I have, um, for those of you who can see, my, my, this is my crew badge actually from the 1991 trip that I still have. Uh, but then um, among other things here, you'll see um, uh, the napkin from the 99-2000 uh, trip that I saved. Uh, and of course, we always had a, a big singing of Old Lang Syne um, at, at midnight. Uh, and I want to take this moment to, with, since that's about old long since, to remember all the many folks that have traveled with us on this trip, uh, the folks that, that are here and still dear friends and the, and the folks who have gone on. Uh, so that's just a quick overview, and there are lots of stories to tell. And uh, Bob Bitzer, I know you've got some things to talk about, so I'm going to hand it off to you. The trip on December 30th, 2000, uh, in addition to being the year 2000, was also one of the snowiest trips we had ever had. Uh, this kind of gives you, an, uh, this is after we actually cleaned the vestibule out of the Dover Harbor. Uh, it was a lot worse. Um, and you can see from that New Jersey A of 7, it's uh, accumulated a little, little bit of the white stuff. So that was a really interesting, snowy trip. In fact, there's a good example. I um, shot out the uh, rear of the Dover uh, Arbor, the rear end, and that kind of gives you an idea of uh, what it was. Uh, and know that um, NJ Dot uh, train is not going to rear end us. They were running on manual block because there were signaling system problems and all sorts of neat stuff was going on. So that uh, commuter train pulled up very close behind us. Uh, we all had clearance to just stop dead for a little while until I finally got the signals up and we continued on into New York. That kind of gives you an idea of how much snow we were kicking up. This was sort of an abstract picture I took of the rear drum head uh, of, uh, on the Dover, and it accumulated a little bit of snow. Needless to say, when we got in New York, we were, as I said, really digging out. But it was, um, it was a whiteout. It was a whiteout. Hey, Bob, this is John. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Thomas is insisting that this is the perfect time to bring out his new line of winter clothing. He says that this is perfect for those cold, snowy days, whether you're on the train, whether you're doing train spotting, <laughs> if you're out Christmas shopping. But he notices that this is what he wanted to show, and it's in red and green, and you can tell it's Thomas whether you're coming or going. His line, there we go. His line includes you can get it in any of your favorite football team colors, and since his uh, blue is sort of like Carolina blue, we know where his allegiance lies. But sorry for that interruption. Thomas insisted. Please continue, Bob. And you know, I might add, you can get those at Macy's. <laughs> <laughs> he just brought the line in. <laughs> That's a free plug for Macy's. I think we're starting here, the uh, Holiday Hops. Uh, this was a series of trips that were run for two years uh, in conjunction with Mark on their commuter trains. We, uh, this particular one was the second year of operation, uh, December 28th. Uh, these trips were highly successful. They were very reasonably priced, and um, it gave people an opportunity to experience the Dover First short trip from Washington, D.C., Union Station to uh, Baltimore's, uh, the Camden Station, which is the Mark Station now. Anyway, uh, these are some pictures reminiscing of uh, some of our, uh, our crews. That was Bernie Gallagher and Mike Malore. And uh, this is the happy crowd uh, on one of our trips. And Mike is in the background. And uh, Renee Lupke is uh, sitting right there in the middle. She's one of our um, board of directors. 
I am. Hi, Renee. How you doing? That's my son next to me, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you. It's He's reminiscent about the same time. age as John's son, apparently. <laughs> Bob, I'll take it back from here. I'd That's like, it. I'd like to thank both Kevin and Bob for those uh, great reminiscings of things we have done in the past, and I hope that it's a future of things we'll do in the future. Next, we'll go on to a very special train called the Liberty Limited, but I want to explain this picture, which was uh, completely not planned to be this way at all. You can see in the background, Lincoln Financial Field, and although many of you may think that this is a stadium for the Philadelphia Eagles, that is completely wrong. This is the shrine of the epitome of American football, where the annual Army-Navy football game is typically played. Now, please disregard any outcome from last week's game, but this is where uh, my allegiance lies because I happen to have gone to Annapolis and we meet the cadets there every year and uh, several of us have teamed up to go there. In this particular picture, Dean Edmonds recognized the value of this as a football memorial place, and he was setting up to take a very nice picture of Lincoln Financial Field, but he delayed just long enough, and this train engine happened to sneak into view. I don't know how he let that happen, but we figured it was a pretty decent picture, even with the train engine. But I'd like to turn it over to Dean Edmonds to give us some information about the Liberty Limited. Dean, please. Thank you, John. What I thought I'd do is I'll start with this image. I'm going to go through some interesting things about the trip, and then we'll go through a couple quick slides. Uh, the Liberty Limited was one, if not the most memorable trip I've ever been part of. The trip was planned by Vivian and Bennett Levin as a thank you to the injured soldiers for their service. The trip rules were very simple. Uh, no press, no brass, no photos, unless the troops wanted them or their permission was provided. Everything was donated. All 15 private cars were donated by their owners, as were the two locomotives. Breakfast, lunch, and dinners were all donated, and that included for food for the onboard crew members and the Philadelphia servicing crews. Philadelphia donated the buses to take the troops to the stadium a short distance, Fueler donated the fuel and fueling of the locomotives and all the cars with generators. A member of the War College donated 50 yard line seats for the troops and their guests. Other suppliers donated field glasses, parkers, blankets, cameras, and many other things, and they were all high quality. Conrail cleared out their intermodal yards just south of the financial field made the most wonderful handicap lifts to assure easy egress and access for those that needed the service and turned the train at no charge. There were a number of memorable events. It started in the morning. I was concerned on how we would work with the injured soldiers and figured our Dover Harbor was probably one of the least handicap friendly of the cars and therefore it would be easy for us. This was not the case. The Dover Harbor was considered one of the most handicap friendly. So we had a number of passengers that were severely injured with prosthetic legs and arms. One soldier demonstrated how to take his prosthetic leg off and put it back on when he was going to run marathons. I found it fascinating and not at all what I imagined. What a positive spirit for a person having sustained such a life changing event. Now, as we left, uh, in Washington, D.C. for Philadelphia, a number of locations along the way, there were dads holding American flags with their sons by their sides. The Army-Navy game is a December game, and it was a cold December evening. It was dark when the game ended. The Conrail ground crew had parked their service trucks spread out over the length of the train with the vehicle headlights shining on the train to provide additional illumination as the soldiers boarded the train. The drivers of each of the service trucks were standing outside by their driver's door. When the train started to move, one of the drivers saluted and the others immediately did the same. All held their salute till the train had left. 
I did not see this because I was serving our guest, but they did and they reported it. Shortly after leaving the rail yard, the train had to enter the Northeast corridor for the run back to Washington, DC. Entering the interlocking south of Philadelphia 30th Street Station can be a time consuming affair. Long waits, not out of the question. That night, the Amtrak dispatcher shut the Northeast corridor down, cleared our train through with no delays. Those on the Excel Expresses had to wait this time. Our train was given highest priority and nothing was in our way, green signals all the way to Washington, DC. And did that train roll? Folks, this is America. I and our chapter were proud to be part of the special opportunity for thanking our military personnel for all they do for us. A special thanks to Vivian and Bennett Levin for coming up with the Liberty Limited idea and executing it flawlessly. That's what I have, and I think the chapter should be very proud of it. Well, thank you very much, Dean. I'm sure we uh, all share your pride in the accomplishment of bringing those people together for that special event. Thomas now would like to point out that he's been closely associated with uh, Christmas in that he's been modeled as a Christmas ornament. And he was very pleased to be chosen, but notice he's in cold iron because he has snow on top of him. But Thomas sort of likes to MC along the lines of what Johnny Carson did. And where Johnny Carson had Ed McMahon, Thomas has Percy. Percy is engine number six and shares in a lot of the adventures of Thomas. But Percy is one of the very, they call him cheeky, but he likes to tease some of the larger engines, even though they're Thomas and Percy are among the smaller of the equipment. Thomas says that he and Percy are hungry. So while I'm getting them some snacks and some more root beer, Let's take a look at dinner on the Dover. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is Scarlett again. Um, dinner on the Dover is one of our long standing traditions in the chapter and going back many, many years. Um, I am a chef on the Dover, but I am not normally one of the Dover chefs. I feel like I should, or on, for dinner on the Dover, I should say that in full disclosure. Um, we wanted to bring this one up because last year we had a very special dinner on the Dover. It was a chef's table style and we did that at Dover Park and it was decorated for Christmas. You saw that in the uh, early slide with the vestibule and um, all the decorations. So what the dinner on the Dover is, um, if we've done it several different ways over the years. We have uh, done it in a kind of traditional Pullman style where we have steak and chicken on the grill of uh, Chef Lawrence, who you see his food right here. Um, this is from last year, but a couple of years ago, he did a B&O style menu on the uh, Dover, and that was very nice. But the real, um, let's say the cream of the crop of these experiences is the chef's table uh, version. And Chef Fran, Chef Lawrence, and Chef Hans helm this up. And it is arranged as a tasting menu of Pretty delectable uh, items. I have often enjoyed this as a uh, passenger. This is a lobster Newburg that uh, Chef Lawrence did last year. Um, this is a dessert. I want to think this is a Hans. It's a it's a pear with an avocado and a raspberry uh, salad, and it was really uh, quite uh, delectable. <laughs> And we usually end up these uh, chef's table versions with a cheese course. Chef Fran plated this, and uh, Chef Hans goes to great lengths to procure some very fine and fancy cheeses and fruits for these. You probably didn't notice it at the table setting, but in addition to our fine china and uh, glassware, we always have custom menus for these events that are a prized souvenir. And uh, Chef Fran, in addition to her chefing talents, is also an artist and historian and comes up with some really beautiful menus for these events. One of the reasons that last year was so very special was because we were able to use the car at Christmas, which we don't usually do. And I will just leave you with this uh, little postcard, a little love letter to uh, the Dover Harbor at Chef's Table. And we look forward to the next time we're able to do that uh, back out on the rails. 
Well, thank you very much, Scarlett. I'd like to point out that Scarlett is head of our programs committee, and she's the one that organizes these monthly programs. Very nicely done, and uh, you're making me hungry. I'd like to turn it over now to Bob Bitzer, who is going to talk about train spotting. Bob, go ahead, please. For uh, several years, we have had a train spotting day uh, at the library, uh, the uh, Washington, D.C. Chapters Library in Bowie, Maryland, at the Tower. This has always been a popular event. It's open to the public. Uh, our members uh, from the library committee and other chapter members come down and volunteer their time. And uh, this was the last one we did. We didn't do one last year because of the weather, inclement weather. That's our library committee. Uh, the gentleman on the left uh, is an, a gentleman who's lived in Bowie his entire life, and he always comes down and says hello to us. That's Eric, uh, who was our, uh, our chief librarian before he passed away. Richard Walter, uh, Barbara O'Rourke, who's our historian, chapter historian, and Warren Schultz, uh, who's a, a longtime chapter member. Train spotting day is just that. This is the busiest day on Amtrak. Uh, more trains operate than any other day uh, on Amtrak's uh, corridor. This is the Northeast Corridor service from Washington to New York to Boston. Here's Typical of train that uh, some of our guests were watching, the Excella. We also provided refreshments. Uh, you can see the, the refreshment table there for uh, all of our guests who came in. Uh, we uh, set up the uh, library with some welcoming information. We had uh, free magazines and books to anyone who wanted them. Computer running, which had some program material from past programs. So we really try to make it quite a, uh, a formal presentation. And of course, what would that weekend be without Mr. and Mrs. Claus? There's Santa and his wife, who graciously posed uh, a pic uh, for a picture for me, even though they were very busy with children and adults saying hello and giving them their wish list. Hey, Bob, I have to interrupt here. Thomas is getting excited about seeing Santa Claus. He's not yet been able to make a visit to Santa Claus because of the restrictions, but he would like to go over his Christmas list, and he's just pulled it out, and it's three typewritten pages. So, uh, Thomas, not right now. We'll have to do that later. Okay. Anything else on train spotting, Bob? I think that's it. Okay. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thomas would also like to point out that uh, – He's participated in the White House Ornament Program. I don't know if you can see the box top very well, but this is the box top from 2014, and this was the two-part ornament that was made that year. Now, Thomas lobbied hard for this engine and tender to be labeled Thomas or Gordon or one of his other friends, but it came out just like this. It does say Christmas, it says White House on the tender, and it's pulling a coach. And this coach says, Christmas 2014. Now, Thomas, on the island of Sodor, where he works, has his two favorite coaches, Annie and Clarabelle. But he also has a deep spot in his heart for Dover Harbor. So he would like to point out that if he got a chance to give Dover Harbor a try, he would do his best to pull it. So, speaking of coaches, I would like to now turn it over to Jim Lilly, our chief mechanical officer, who's going to tell you about our coach. Dover Harbor. Jim, take it away, please. All right. Well, despite COVID keeping um, the car from roaming the mainline rails of America, um, the Operations and Equipment Committee has actually been very, very busy this year, um, making some improvements and upgrades and repairs to our um, Grand Pullman car. And I'm going to take you through and show you some of what we've been up to. So these are just some of our projects we've been doing. So every year we do an Amtrak annual inspection um, and it's called a PC-1 and it's performed by a qualified mechanical person or QMP as Amtrak refers to it. We completed that in 2020 this year. Typically costs us a few thousand dollars. Our next inspection is scheduled for February, March of 2021. Now a big thing coming up is every 10 years or 200,000 miles, Amtrak requires what they call a PC-2A. 
in this test, the car is jacked up off the trucks. The trucks are rolled out and everything's visually inspected and, and needed repairs are made to get the car back to Amtrak standards. Our last one costs about $60,000 plus transport to and from a qualified shop. So, and our next one is due in January, 2022. So we will spend a lot of time this year planning for that next thing. And I just want to stress, this is not an exhaustive list of requirements, but that's, that's um, heavy on the horizon. They're coming around the bend, I think is a better railroad term. Um, all right, so the first big outside project we did this year was to repair the roof of the Dover Harbor. And this is not unusual. Um, we actually have to um, repaint it about every 18 months. This one was a little more involved in some of the prior projects because we had some patches over some of the seals and over some of the seams in the roof that um, had gotten to the point where they had water under them. And so we had to take those off. But you can see the result in the picture on the right, which is our newly resealed and cleaned up roof. So we had to do this every 18 months or two years. All right. And just a refresher, um, this was the, the appearance of the car's lounge last March. It was last repainted in 1934. We got a grant um, in 2019 to do a lounge um, refresh project. And I'm going to walk you through now where we are on that project, so, which is still a little bit in progress. So we started in April taking the lounge apart. Um, and that's taking every piece, basically every piece of brass off the wall, removing the furniture, removing the tables. We did set the light fixtures instead of taking them off. We did take them and just set them away from the walls and down from the ceiling on screws so we could paint behind them. At this point, you can see the furniture is just about gone. Just about everything is off the walls um, except for the window trim, which we left up. Um, and we're getting pretty close to paint time. Um, and we use lots and lots of painter's tape. Here you can see on the right how we set a light fixture off the wall. Um, and then you can see that they started doing some sanding behind it. But this setting them off the wall made it a lot easier and had to unwire and rewire everything. So our, our volunteers um, did all the work to take the lounge apart, included in this was also the foyer and the restroom to take all every, everything off the wall, the blinds down and get the car ready. And then we used a professional painter come in and in about two weeks he sanded all the walls and the ceilings down primed it bonded to make sure there's an even surface sanded and then applied two coats of paint there's three colors of base paint in the lounge so lots of prep here's some of the work when we say we took it apart i mean we took the doors out of the car we took the window tracks out each one of these had to be individually labeled each screw hole had to be marked for everything in the car and a diagram of where the screws went on the part. Um, and actually we had to make a template so that the screw that came out of the upper left hole went back in the upper left hole, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This shows some progress. The ceiling painting is just about done at this point. And then working on the um, upper clear story or um, another term for it, I can't remember right now, but you can see we're making progress, white paint. All right, and here pretty much the base painting is complete. We did take all the furniture out of the car except for the two set T's. And the base painting is complete at this point. Um, and then here is the restroom and foyer before painting. And here is the restroom and foyer after painting. Um, you can see it's much brighter, it's much cleaner. In fact, for those of us who are on the car all the time, we were actually surprised at just how much brighter it made it because we don't see it because we see it every day. But um, it's amazing how beautiful it is. You can see the brass in the wall has all been on those fixtures has all been refinished for all the doors, all the doors, all those hatches came out. Um, the hinges were redone. Some of them repainted. They were all stripped and put back. So all by hand, all by our volunteers. This is the new stenciling that went up in the lounge. This is, um, correct stenciling for the Dover series cars circa 1934. We know that from some blow up pictures we have of Pullman Company photos. Um, and you can see what the light fixtures look like on the left, as well as the, the stenciling in place around the uh, on top of the lounge. And details really do make a difference. 
when we took this doorbell loose from the wall so that we could paint it, the wood block behind it, I guess after 97 years, had basically dry rotted and it split on us. So we found a very talented woodworker who made models for the U.S. Navy and just happens to be my father-in-law. And we had him make an exact duplicate of what we had and put it back together. So, and it looks as good as new and you'd never really know that it's a replacement. So, I mean, it fits exactly to include the screw holes. And that's the kind of detail and effort that we put into every little bit of this project. All right. And while we were doing this project, um, we used it as an opportunity to replace the flooring in the lounge, in the uh, foyer and in the restroom. We'd already done it in other parts of the car. Um, this is a project that we've been working on for quite some time. The material on the right is, is original Pullman material that we found under the toilet when we took it up. And something that a couple of us who've been around the car for 30 years remembered um, but had to be replaced in the 90s when most of it broken up. We found a company in Akron, Ohio, Rubber Corporation of America, which made a, a very, very, very similar material. And that's what you see on the left. And as part of this project, we replaced the flooring in the uh, restroom in the foyer. And I think it looks pretty good. So again, trying to keep the car authentic. All right. Now, this is a fun little project. This is the, the lounge fan, which we took down and took to an electrical shop and had it repainted or had it um, reworked so that it was up to snuff. Took it back to the car, hooked it back up, turned it on, and I looked at it a couple days later and I realized that there was oil all over the, my new, newly painted ceiling and the walls. And... Um, so I called the shop back up and they said, bring it back up to me. So we took it back up there and they looked at it again and cleaned it up and handed it back to me and said, oh, how are you hanging this? I said, well, I'm hanging it just like I took it off the wall. And I showed them and they said, well, that's upside down. The oil cup is supposed to be down, not up. Well, as it turns out, that's the way this fan and all the bedroom fans have been on the car since we got the car in the 1970s. So we actually are now in the process of getting all the fans reworked and putting them back the way the manufacturer and the way Pullman would have had them, which is with the oil cup down, which has the, the nice side effect of not throwing oil everywhere. So the things you learn when you don't have a Pullman manual. All right, and here is a picture of the lounge coming together. You can see we don't have the blinds back up yet. We're not putting curtains back. That's one of the things about this project. And But most of the furniture is back and we're working on putting everything back on the walls, the trim, the mirrors back, the lights are back, the lampshades are back, et cetera. Just paper down to help protect the flooring as we work. Almost back at that point. All right, so, and that's about where we are with that project. We're still waiting on the, uh, all the furniture and tables are back now. We're still waiting on the uh, blinds to be manufactured. We're trying to get priority with the uh, company in Alexandria that's doing it. But unfortunately, they told us that the customer in front of us is the White House and we're going to have to wait. So, but we'll get there. Another project that we did this went, this summer was to replace the pedestal liners, which are the um, pieces of plastic, look plastic looking or carbon fiber things you see in the um, in the right photo. The one on the left is a worn one. The one on the right is a new one. And basically what these do, you can see the sides of them and they sit inside the journal where the wheel rides up and down on the truck and they prevent the wheel from wearing directly into the metal. And after a while, these carbon fiber um, liners wear out and we have to have them replaced. So they were all replaced this summer, so which is good. After 30 plus years, of faithful service, the wastewater tank on the far end, the A end of the car under bedroom A finally gave up the ghost. You can see the hole that developed in it on the left side in the left picture, um, although the tank is sitting on, on its side, not on, not on its bottom. Um, and so we had a new one fabricated and installed in September and it, fits exactly and looks exactly like the old one. So 
but should be good for another 30 years of holding stuff. Let's say that it's a dirty job. Next. All right. What's next? Car was winterized in early November. We're looking at painting one or two of the bedrooms over the winter. Um, we expect the blinds to come in probably, in, we're guessing in March, the PC1 I mentioned, and vaccines and um, health willing. We hopefully will get back on the rails in 2021 for a good season before we take her to the shop. And I'll just say, if you want to um, help work in the car, let, let me know. You can make a difference. You don't have to come with a lot of experience. Um, one thing about the railroad is we train on the job. A couple other things I just want to make you aware of. The, uh, we launched a new DoverHarbor.com last spring. We were also featured a new Kambach video on the Pullman Company called America's Hotel on Wheels. The car is actually in there. And there's a new video tour of the car online. So from all of us in the Operations and Equipment Committee, we just want to wish everyone happy holidays and we hope to see you out on the rails in 2021. Well, thank you, Jim. It's clear that you and your team have been doing an awful lot of work out there. We're glad to see it and uh, to keep the car in great condition. That's wonderful. Thank you. Fran, I have to tell you that your earlier instruction is already taking effect. My son, who was hugging Thomas earlier, who lives in Manhattan, says he is there and he is now having a Manhattan. So that's the quickest turnaround. He never did any of his chemistry projects that quickly. But I guess if you have the right motivation, things can happen. Thomas uh, is starting to yawn, so I better wrap things up. Our last item tonight is going to take about 11 more minutes of your evening. Many people are familiar with O. Whiston Link's photography, which documented the end of the steam era on the Norfolk and Western Railroad. But Link also did sound recordings, so tonight we have perhaps his best-known railway railroad sound recording and is quite fitting to close our program. It comes from his second LP record, The Fading Giant. It was recorded at 9.39 p.m. on Christmas Eve, 1957, at Rural Retreat, Virginia. Mrs. J.E. Dodson plays carols on the Lutheran church bells. We hear train number 42, the Pelican, approach, arrive, and depart with 17 cars behind a Class J locomotive, number 603. Although a still shot for your eyes, I'm sure the sounds will bring back treasured memories of heading home for Christmas by train, boat, plane, car, and the anticipation of friends, food, and families. So consider dimming your lights and being comfortable. And while you do, I'll close by saying we very much appreciate your sharing this time with us together tonight. A spe special thank you to all those who prepared and participated in tonight's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. And I'll leave you with the Birmingham special gets the high ball at Rural Retreat, Virginia. On behalf of everyone here tonight and your friends and family, wherever they may be, best wishes for this very special season of the year and hopes for a grand 2021. Good night.